Do, do, do. And we are live. I'm taking one everything, everyone out, and here we go. Everybody, <laughs> welcome to the James Police Show. It's your life. I am Dr. Michelle Cooley, and we are here on a Friday, and we're so happy. Happy Friday the 13th, everybody. Woo! Friday the 13th, Michelle. How are you? I am doing fine. Audience, we have our guest co-host today, Joshua Goldsmith, um, joining us for this amazing interview today. And Dr. James Cooley's a little under the weather today. So Josh is pitching in and we are just excited about this show. So Josh, how was your day? How's everything going? Everything's going pretty good. You know, the, the you know, obviously I'm a market guy. So, you know, the markets have been uh, last week or so uh, in tentative recovery mode and, uh, you know, puts everybody in a better mood, uh, so to speak, when they're aware of it and um, puts me in a good mood. Well, so well. how about you? How's your day going? My day is going great. I have been so busy today. I've been all over the place. I have. I just came back from the gym and I run some errands and I go back out again. It's It's been a long day. And, you know, Monday, a lot of people are off is celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. And we have some amazing shows for next week. And... 
But today is the day that we have an amazing guest on the show. And audience, if you want to be part of this conversation, please go into the comments, whoever platform you're on, if you're on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, just type in your comments for this amazing guest today. So let me start talking about what the title of the show is. It's called One Man's Journey to Rock and Roll. And the show is about getting to know the background of the founding father of rock and roll in the Soviet Union, Valery Safodinov. I hope I said that correctly. Sorry. And we're going to talk about rock and roll in the USSR, learn about studio life at Studio Flight 19, and discuss the Rockin' the Kremlin documentary. So let's talk a little bit about our guest today. Back in the 60s, Valery shocked the Kremlin and rocked a whole generation. He created the first rock and roll band, the USSR, and had to make his own electric guitar because the instrument was otherwise banned by Soviet authorities. His concerts together with Pitts Anderson's and others caused near riots in Riga. And now two U.S. filmmakers produce a documentary called Rockin' the Kremlin about how Siski and other Latvian rock and rollers started a musical revolution on the dark side of the Iron Curtain. During the 60s and 70s, Siski led three successful bands in Riga, The Revengers, Natural Product at Three and a Half. In 1974, he immigrated to the United States where he continued to play rock with the other former Soviet musicians, appeared on numerous US TV shows, and eventually, eventually, founded his own recording studio. Today, he lives in San Diego and continues to make music in his Flight 19 studio. He's worked with many young talents, including Eddie Vedder, who went on to form the Seattle rock group Pearl Jam. And he also released several CDs, including Moonlight Jam, At the Gas Lamp, Electric Tank, and Go Go Boom Boom. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show today, Valeri, and I'm going to pronounce this right, Say yeah, food enough. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Hi, hello there. Hi, guys. Hi, how are you doing? You. I'm doing all right. All right. Yes. Great nice to see to you be here with all of you. Yes. It's so great to have you on our show today. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, thanks to our guest co-host Joshua Goldsmith for the introductions. Yeah. And you know, your story is very fascinating, and I'm sure the documentary is more fascinating, but we're going to start from the beginning. So can you, so Valeria, can you tell our audience what area did you grow up in, and what was your fondest memories? Oh, uh, I was born in Riga. It's a capital of Latvia, which used to be a, one of the Re Soviet Union republics, and uh, it's a port city, pretty cosmopolitanian. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people there, a lot of mixture, uh, and uh, the because it's on the Baltic Sea across the Sweden, uh, you can uh, hear the radio, shortwave radio, some European stations, and uh, when I was six years old, my mother bought me on my birthday a shortwave radio, and I started listening to the whole world basically and i fall in love with uh, american music and american language i mean english language so uh -huh. and uh, so i'll spend the nights and fall asleep right by the radio <laughs> and she will pick me up and take me put me in my bed but anyway uh yeah and that uh, kind of uh, did impact on me a lot and then uh also, when I, you know, was about, I think, about eight o'clock, eight o'clock, eight, eight years old, I met this gypsy guy. He was about 16 years old, and he played guitar, played all this gypsy music, and uh, and I was, you know, really wanted to learn how to play it. Of course, he said, I'm not going to teach you, just watch me, and I started trying to figure it out. I get a hold of the acoustic guitar and uh, start getting it, start playing a little bit. And then he said, oh, come and play with me in the parks or whatever gathering where people dance and drink. And uh, I was a little kid and 
learned that stuff and everybody liked that <laughs> but uh, but he was i learned from him he was doing all kinds mm -hmm. of tricks with guitar playing with his teeth and then put it put guitar in the back of his head playing it this way so i pick up all that stuff too and then uh, i um was a little kid and back then and um, i already went to school and I saw the first documentary about um, uh, Russian troop dancers, very famous one, touring the world. And they were in Madison Square Garden performing. And uh, back, and they show a little bit of the backstage later when Harry Belafonte inter, um, came backstage with a couple of musicians to entertain them. And he and they filmed him singing "When the Saints Go Marching In," and I was blown away. And I skipped the school, run to that little theater, hide there behind the curtain, and come out just to to see him sing and play that song. And then after that, I'll run back home, grab guitar, try to learn it, the whole you know groove and. Structure and and get the words, and I did it like for, I don't know twenty times till I got it right. Well, Valeri, what, what is the uh -huh. what, what is the best advice uh -huh. that your family ever gave you? My family. What's the best advice? Best advice. Uh, um, always be nice to people. <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, sometimes like our family, they instill certain values in us and morals. Right, yeah. And we just take it with us. Yeah, my mother. Our lives was, in yeah. all areas. My mother wasn't too crazy about me going to music. She said, you have to be a professional, get uh, some education. So I went to study architecture. But then rock and roll <laughs> happened and I just drop after three years. <laughs> well, I'm going to let Josh yeah. pick that up. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, no, the story, Valeri, the story yeah. you were telling about uh, Harry Belafonte and uh, well, the, yeah. the, the Saints, uh, this is how you got your nickname. Right. That's why I was saying that because uh, and I start playing that song and people gather and everybody loved it and scream and yell and dance. And uh, everybody didn't know my name, so they called me, oh, that guy that plays When the Say, because they couldn't pronounce right, so they started calling me When the Sayski, and then Sainski, and then it shortened to Sainski, so that's how I got my nickname. Okay, nice. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure. Harry Belafonte. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Yeah, uh, wow. and then... And then quickly, just uh, one more thing that I remember after that, I was walking down the street. And at the time, there was a black market, you know, underground market. People were selling these bone records, which was made out of the th thin film, x-rays film, where you can see the bone skeleton and, you know, spine. And they cut it in round. Uh, make it round and put the hole in the center and then groove that with whatever song and you can play the record maybe 20 times and they'll be shredded and and so one day i was walking by my house and from the window on the second floor the, the window was open and guy was blasting rock around the clock and i was standing there listening to it like i don't know 10 to times and I just could not believe how great it was and that uh, that threw me into the vein of uh, early rock and roll and then I discovered at the time people like Ray Charles, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, that's from whom I learned. Uh, th they were my uh, models and the early rockability too from like Johnny Burnett and records, Larry. There are bone records. They were they called the nickname for them was bone records, which was like a thin plastic round ones. They were okay. making them underground, and people were selling them like disposable, almost right. Disposable 
if you remember, maybe in sometimes in some magazines, they will have the inlay of some piece of plastic square one. You can rip it off, put it on a turntable, and you can play it. But it won't last long, though. I have a big question. I mean, I'm sure yeah. everybody's, you yeah. know, sure. willing, you know, wanting to know. Is like, tell, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, how how are you known for being the f the the father of rock and roll in the USSR? Uh, you know, and and uh, who who tell us about how you how you got that and and the men your well, mentor. Uh, here, well, the story is, uh, um, I already was playing guitar and playing rock and roll in the parks and people, you know. People were arresting. Uh, the, we were arrested for doing just because people been drinking and you know having fun. Uh, and uh, then I have a friend who was going abroad, and he brought the catalog of a Fender electric guitar, guitars catalog, and I f saw the picture of Fender Stratocaster, and I saw this guitar, and I just like. That's the most beautiful thing I've seen in my life. <laughs> and uh, so, and there was a drawing with all the dimensions and everything. So I cut it out, piece of wood as a form of it. And I have a guys who were the, in, in, into electronics and they could rig up the pickups and the potentiometers and whatever, and can build a little bit the amplifiers out of the old radios. And uh, the problem was the neck. And so we took the neck from the acoustic guitar and screwed it into the body and it worked. And so we made a couple of guitars like that. And the bass, the bass was big problem, the strings, because there was no bass strings back then. There was no electric guitars, nothing. There was nothing like that. So you have to do all by yourself. So guys cut the, from some place they cut the from the upright piano they cut those strings that matches the neck the size and everything and the bass player was playing and he was bleeding his fingers he will tape them because the strings were so rough anyway so and that's how we did um, uh, four of us got together my three buddies and we made the very first band with electric guitars and that was 1962 wow. um, in the middle of 1962 and then we found a place where we can uh, practice in some kind of a workers club kind of a place and uh, some factory they have some cultural you know places with the stage and the, where they have parties and meetings and all that stuff with the hey, communist yeah. like hold that thought yeah. we gotta take us with some a station break but we will be right. back to this of course audience to have a good time with our guest today valeri and like i said if you want to ask him any questions just go into the comments field and type in your comments and we will read it we'll be back with the james cooley show it's your life with Val our guest today valeri all right I
when you leave high school, you got to know today or tomorrow, or hopefully today, what your plans are. Hopefully, you know, there is no bad decision unless there is no plan. Create, collaborate, commit with confidence. Commit with what? Commit with what? And everything that you do. Welcome back, everybody, to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. We're here with our guest today, Valeri, and he, we've learned so many amazing stuff about him, about, you know, how he embraced the love of music and certain um, musical role models that um, he discovered as a young man. And of course, here we have our guest co-host today, Joshua Goldsmith. Um, Dr. James Cooley's a little bit under the weather, but he is with us in spirit. So before we start off with uh, some more conversational questions with you, Valeri, we got a video to play. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about this uh, electric tank, uh, red hot lipstick, go, go, boom, boom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it's, uh, one of the songs that I wrote and produced and recorded with my guys at the time. Um, and uh, we shoot it all in one day, which was amazing. Uh, it's a kind of a, we try to make everything kind of a 70s vintage, almost like when uh, Tarantino makes the movies, he's trying to be true to all the um, exact timing of the whatever the movie is. So we try to, everything is authentic in there. And it's a, you know, kind of a, based on the, stupid little idea of the some Colombian mafia things they trying to get the code from the uh and it's hidden in a lipstick and uh anyway it's just uh, uh Daniel Gonzalez shoot that video which was you know mm -hmm. um work with him and it's fun <laughs> we'll see a little bit of uh, well, this a video yeah, yeah. Так, ну она выехала. Какой у агента код? Красная губная помада. Red Hot Lipstick. Хорошо. fun <laughs> yeah that it was i yeah. bet it was so that valeri was 
Can you kind of tell us, I know you talked a little about your mom and everything like that. Can you tell us about the story about the shortwave radio that you received on your birthday and yeah. also the story about the gypsy that turned you on to play the guitar? Right, yeah. Well, that uh, uh, radio was the savior for me because um, it was... Uh, I would lay, even later on, I will sit and record on a tape machine. I got the, you know, first tape recorders and I will record some uh, Voice of America, um, BBC and Radio Luxembourg. They will have the um, top 20 and, you know, I will write down and listen to it. And then if I like the song, I will record it and uh, later after that, at night, I will try to write the words, what that means. Your girl is red hot, my girl ain't doodly squat. So I can, I can understand what that, that slang was, which was funny. Um, but yeah, and I uh, learned from that. Uh, and uh, the, that radio is very, was helpful because in the daytime, they will be jamming it. You couldn't hear it, but at night you could. And uh, so that was pretty much my love for American music. I totally fall in love with uh, all kinds of forms of American music from boogie woogie to rec time to jazz to R&B, soul, Motown, you know, everything. <laughs> I, yeah, I was lucky in my life to meet my hero Chuck Berry actually and Aww. talked to him for about 10 15 minutes <laughs> wow. yeah but I saw Ray Charles three times he's oh, one wow. of the big one for me um anyway so so uh oh and little Richard of course I saw him wife <laughs> I was great one of the great greatest screamer of of them all uh but uh you Jeep's have an Elvis. Right. You have an Elvis signature too. You have an autograph, right, Elvis? Signature. Yeah. Well, it was a gift from a friend, a really good friend of mine. He gave me the picture that Elvis signed on a film of the Jailhouse Rock. It wasn't signed for me. Right, right. <laughs> I wish it was, but uh, anyway. Uh, but the Gypsy guy. It's another story. He was. They. They were traveling. You know, like always Gypsy do, they come to one town, they live there for a while. And this guy, Gypsy guy, was incredible. And uh, the only thing that, you know, what happened was I invited him, you know, come to have a bite in my place. And while I was in the kitchen, I think I didn't know that. Then I came home in the evening and... Uh, my mother said, well, my old jewelry's been stolen. <laughs> so anyway, so I, uh, and I knew right away that it was him, but what could I do? So I ran, I knew where they were, you know, outside on the outskirts of town, they were have their tents and everything. So, well, actually before that, you know, I was playing while I was playing with him, I used to, go and play some gypsy weddings with him as a kid. And so, but anyway, I ran to that place and of course they already took took off to somewhere, I don't know where, and I didn't see him. And then when I was about 13, which is crazy story, when I, uh, gypsy, uh, the gold tooth, Nick, Nickel, Nick the gold tooth, that was his nickname. He has a crown, gold crown. And so I'm walking on the street after, you know, three years after that, and, and on the busy street with a lot of stores, and somebody screamed, thief, stop him. And I see him running away, and uh, and I recognize him. That's, that's the gold tooth. And so they're running. So he ran across the street, and the car hit him, and then he fall into the rails where the trolley will go and it cut him in half. Oh no. An incredible amount of people gather around and I came and he and he see and I'm right there in front of him. He sees me. He grabs his tooth and th that golden crown, take it off and throw it to me. And who is this again? Who is this? 
the gold tooth, the gypsy guy. Oh, the gypsy guy. That I learned from to yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. But Larry, let me ask you a question. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the story with the gypsy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The he was, you know, he was like amazing. You know, I really <laughs> like him no matter what, even if he stole some jewelry. I don't care. <laughs> and this is the guy that that was uh, helped you pivotal for you to get into music, correct? Well, it's he was just one that played guitar because for me it was like amazing. I could see that. Guitar is not uh, just of furniture hanging on the wall. It's an right. instrument that you can play and sing at the same time. That's what yeah. totally blew me away, and I learned that. Well, what was going on in, in Riga uh, between 1969 and 1972 in the rock and roll scene? Tell us yeah, well, that was a completely different scene because it was... Uh, uh, because when I came back from Army, I put the band uh, called Natural Product, and we start playing because I I wasn't compromising. I never sang any Russian songs or Soviet songs. I only love American music, and you know I only play American rock and roll or R and B. Uh, so uh, so they uh, people. And all the young crowd was just like wanted to hear it. And they, any time we play anywhere, like universities, colleges, big places, there'll be so many people coming, and it start getting out of hand. And the police and KGB they started to see that it's uh, they need to suppress that. So. Uh, I was taken many times to the police station. There was a file on me on KGB and everything, and people will be arresting for you know playing music. So they say if you're not gonna stop, we'll exile you. So yeah. you, so I couldn't you know stay there and play music. So I s decided that I need to get out of there, and the only place I wanted to be would be United States. Well, originally it was England uh, because I have a lot of British friends. I met uh, and so but anyway America was my goal to go because uh, so I wanted to be you know uh, one quick thing I want to say that you know you could be living there and be like the monkey see monkey do learn you know something but I wanted to be part of the American culture American music so I needed to be here I need to soak it in and uh, feel it and be here and become American, so I could uh, play this music as a part of me since I was a kid, because that's what I love. Mm -hmm. I got a question for you. Did you love disco? Did you love American disco music? Disco? Okay. Here's the thing for me, because I, uh, I think the first kind of a thing was uh, Stevie Wonder superstitious because he came up with that groove. Mm -hmm. I mean, a any music, it, it, all the rhythm, it goes all the way from Africa. <laughs> but uh, the, he, he was the one first to play hi-hat and the snare and created and he created that drum groove and you can hear it in, in uh, superstitious. Mm -hmm. uh, in that song, and that's what started, I think, that whole disco thing. And 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 you know, like, there's always will be uh, music to dance, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it all evolves from you know, cha cha cha, rumba, twist, <laughs> you twist. <name> it, <laughs> to go to what we have now, the hip hop, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, electronic. Uh, EDM stuff. So, when, when did you come to America, Valer? That was uh, seventy-five. Okay. And then what did you do when you when you got here? Well, when I got here, I uh, end up in Berkeley, uh, which was a great place at the moment. <laughs> uh, and uh, I uh, then I moved to San Francisco. And that's where, um, oh, when I was in Berkeley, I, my first job was a bartender. I learned all the drinks. <laughs> because in <laughs> Russia, you have only 
vodka, cognac, wine, and champagne. <laughs> well, well, That's about well, it. Wait, hold that thought. We got to take a commercial break. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> okay. So, like, hey, audience, if you have any questions for Valeri, please just type in your comments. We will read it out and we will ask Valeri the questions on the James Cooley Show. It's your life. We'll be right back. Dr. James J.C. Cooley. Yay! Yay! charity. We are veterans. We are warriors, brothers, and sisters. We don't need, we deliver. Opsforvets.com. Handshakes, not handouts. Dingley here, producer of The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. And the new audio version of James' book, Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, is a must-have. James shares his true life story of struggle and success in America. It's both a cautionary tale and a roadmap to achieving the American dream. Get the new audio version of Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, by James Cooley on Amazon.com or wherever audiobooks are sold. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. We are just, like I said, we're just excited to have uh, this amazing guest today, Valeri. Valeri comes on the show. I mean, you know, I'm I'm getting out the champagne. He mentioned champagne. It's a Friday. You know, things are looking good. You know, it's a celebration, my friend. Celebration of life. And it's Friday the 13th. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, anyway, hey. yeah, as you were saying, yeah, that was my first job in America, bartender. So I learned my ties, everything, uh, how to mix the drinks uh, for a little bit. Cheers. And then I met, uh, well, I have a, by coincidence, I'm meeting the drama with whom I played in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, two guys from Moscow and we set up, uh, start playing together. And there was a friend of them who was the uh, Jerry Setzer, who was the first guy that did the uh, computerized ticket sales for events. And that was a very um, new thing and uh, took off. And he was in association or, uh, again with the Bill Graham, who did all the big rock concerts. So the, he throw us in there to play to open uh, for uh, Winterland and for the Blue Oyster Cold, Bob Seger. Then we played opening a lot of shows, concert places for the band, Public Cruise. I mean, a lot, a lot of gigs. And there was uh, some publicity was going on. There was a 
article in Rolling Stones with our picture well, <laughs> of the band. And it was a little bit kind of like a politi more political thing uh, in, in that sense, because, oh, this guy's from behind the Iron Curtain playing rock and roll, just a novelty thing. I, I wasn't, you know, I wanted to be more music. So anyway, the band kind of a fall apart, but we did a, a Today Show. Uh, we did, um, well, actually, the first one was on Walter Cronkite News. Wow. <laughs> he started, which was like amazing. He said, well, whatever he said, there is a news, there is a Russian rock and roll band in the United States, and it's Valery, Sasha, Yuri, Yakov, blah, blah, blah. So, and that was fun. Uh, now, uh, and that didn't last. So after that, I um, decided to, because I figured out that pretty early that all the music is made in the recording studios, mostly, unless it's a mm -hmm. live concert recording or whatever. So to me, studio, and I went to a few studios through, with some, some of my friends took me in San Francisco to a couple of famous studios, Wally Hyder and all that. So, and I fall in love with that whole environment that you can create and record uh, your ideas or band or mm -hmm. whatever. So that's how I moved towards the recording uh, to be a recording engineer. So that was really, you know, start getting some equipment and recording my music and uh, also, again, playing with some people at the same time, because I love to play. I, you know, that's the gr one of the greatest things to be playing uh, with the great musicians. You know, you can. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so that was that. And then uh, at, at the time, there was nothing holding me at, in San Francisco. Uh, because yeah, I had uh, you end up in, in San Diego with uh, Flight 19. Tell us about Flight 19. Yeah, that and uh, so I kind of uh, um, I have a really good friend Nick Binkley who I met in '77, and we became really longtime friend. And he's a musician too. And he was living here, and I was visiting him, and I fell in love with this place. It's nice and warm. San Francisco is always foggy, even in the summer. Uh, so at night here is nice and warm. So I, uh, he said, well, why don't you move here and we'll open a studio here? And I said, okay. And I moved, moved here and, uh, found a place in Carlsbad and opened the studio there. And, uh, I was kind of interested. Uh, I remember reading about, uh, Flight 19, which was a uh, five plane vanished in Bermuda Triangle in 1945. Um, and, and that was a Flight 19. And one thing interesting I like about it, it was uh, that uh, they were talking to a tower about all the strange things going on with their planes. Uh, and they were recording to a tape. And uh, my guess is they ran out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I kind of uh, liked the idea. Flight 19. Oh, wow. Uh, disappearance. And, uh, and the place where I got the Carlsbad studio, it was a, my unit was F-19. So I thought, oh, well, coincidence. Plus, I took the plane from Europe to United States. When I left Europe to come here, it was uh, Flight 19. So I thought, okay, this some coincidences and I called the studio Flight 19. Uh, a logo was flying to a music and never come back. <laughs> wow. So, so anyway, so that was that. And there was a whole bunch of bands there. Uh, in San Francisco studio, I have a lot of reggae bands, a lot of first punk bands. And there was a lot of funny things there. There was guys were bringing me flyers and there was one flyer somebody stole it actually but it, i wish i still have it it says uh zippers were opening for dickheads there was a band called dickheads and there was a oh. band zippers the <laughs> punk bands okay valeri so, yeah valeri tell us about rocking the kremlin documentary and what role did you play in this 
Oh, well, yeah, that goes back to my friend Nick Binkley. Uh, we he knew my story, and we were talking about it. And uh, and I and one time I think I mentioned I said, wouldn't it be nice to make some kind of a documentary or something to show American American um, public how incredible and influential American music was to the whole the rest of the world and uh, and that idea kind of uh, uh, stuck with him and uh, and he has a very good friend in new york douglas yeager who was managing adetta and josh white jr and uh, actually later on i met adetta which was big you know thing in for me because i love her and uh and so he talked to him and they start thinking about it. That would be interesting to do something like that. And my, my thought it will be more of the showing the Americans how incredible American music is. And I think it still is that everybody takes from America, starting jazz, rock and roll, rap, hip hop, anything you want. It's always... It's a birthplace of that music. And uh, so it, it, it got an idea and they started writing and thinking about it. And then we went to, uh, which was kind of a based on my story, how I started the uh, first rock and roll band and how it influenced. But it, besides Soviet Union, it was big everywhere. All the Eastern Bloc, uh, China, I mean, everywhere else. It was quite a bit of uh, influence everywhere. Everybody wanted to rock <laughs> in the world. So anyway, so it started building up and it took quite a bit of time to get the footage, the interviews. We went to uh, Riga, Moscow, Leningrad many times to do things. And then, uh, and in this documentary, this documentary actually portrays the how soft power can influence and can help to bring down the uh, socialism structure and turn Russia to uh, more kind of a democracy, although it didn't work out, I think. Valeri, hold yeah. that thought. We got to take a commercial break, but Absolutely. we'll be right back. Hey, everyone, you want to join the conversation, ask Valeri some yeah. questions, please just put in your comments and we will read them to them. The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. that make veterans are the values that make veteran businesses America's number one choice. Veteran business owners throughout the nation are ready to connect. Opsforvets.com. Handshakes, not handouts. Opsforvets connects veterans with business opportunities. Here is a closer look at a featured veteran business. Every business listed is a verified veteran-owned business and can be found in the OpsForVets.com supplier directory. OpsForVets.com. Get on the grid.
Welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life and with our guest co-host, Joshua Goldsmith, and our guest today, Valerie. And audience, it's not too late to go in and type in your comments or questions you want to ask to, for Valerie. And um, we're just going to keep rolling with these questions. So you were talking about rocking the Kremlin documentary. Yes. And um, just keep on going. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to say that... Uh, uh, and then it became uh, very interesting uh, in a sense that uh, uh, there was a grant uh, money to produce the film came from the Endowment for Humanity, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, did also contribute it. And, uh, and uh, Nick Binkley and Doug Yeager, they got the uh, Emmy Award winning uh, documentary uh, director and producer Jim Brown and he loved the idea and we uh, went to Moscow with him, start shooting a lot of things there and uh, got a whole, uh, and there was uh, interviews from uh, uh, Gorbachev uh, to Jimmy Carter and uh, Keith, Keith Sutherland did the narration for that uh, documentary. And then uh, when it was all assembled, uh, it's, uh, you know, Hungarian ambassadors, Latvian president, a lot of people uh, talk about things uh, about it in that movie. Uh, and uh, and then uh, when it was done, it was showing in a lot of places. We did a premiere in Rock and Roll Hall of Fame there. Uh, went around Europe, uh, everywhere from Moscow to Prague to Berlin to, ah, oh God, I, I don't even remember all the places. And it was also, was here on KPBS on the... Unbelievable. On, I remember on, uh, going to the uh, showing of that. Of that at, uh, right, we pre presented, State. right, yeah, in the States and then uh, in Los Angeles uh, University, uh, LA, UCLA, God, many, many places. Where, where can we see that video now? Where can we see? I Rocky think it's. Uh, I think you can download it from the uh, uh, Vimeo. I think have it Vimeo. Okay. okay. And I think you yeah. can also go to uh, rockingthekremlin.com and uh, get all the information too. Incredible. It's a sixty minutes. Uh, it's not very long, but very exciting. It's a pretty yeah. interesting. Well, yeah. Let, let me ask you a question. Uh, what was yeah. it like uh, being a mentor for Eddie Vedder, uh, the lead singer of Pearl Jam? Uh, and well, how did that happened, come about? Yeah, yeah, well, what happened, there was a local band called Bed Radio. Well, I don't, yeah, and uh, their singer, they needed to change the singer, and then they uh, decided to do audition, and they were practicing and, and recording in my studio in Carlsbad, my first one here and uh and so the uh they auditioned three singers three singers came by and uh they went through and one of them was young kid eddie vetter <laughs> yeah and after that they left they were sitting in my control room and they were asking so what do you think what what's good and i said well there was one guy was okay but he was kind of a more goth type of guy yeah. and i said uh, yeah eddie seems to be pretty good and they all yeah we will really like him and they got him and they started working in my place for about two years a little over two years and during that time uh, me and him became really good friends he was very you know uh, eager young man and uh, and i told him a lot about you know, Europe, about culture, about literature, history, and, uh, you know. I mean, did you know really that he was going to be the star? No, I didn't know. Well, I knew that, uh, you know, he was a uh, really good songwriter. He started writing really good songs. And um, and I think he kind of grew out of the, uh, the situation here and uh, at that time the Seattle was start happening well a little bit before that there was all this hair bands at the time with yeah. the spandex and the pretty faces <laughs> anyway so he uh, but uh, 
so he decided, you know, like to go to explore. And he went to LA first and uh, hang out with all these guys. There was a place called Nirvana and uh, with the chili peppers. And then he will be telling me, Valeri, come on over, hang out with us. And, you know, I said, yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> all that. And then, uh, and then he went to Seattle and I think auditioned with some recordings that I did with them. And they, uh, there was a band called Mother Love Bone or some kind of other one. Uh, and their singer, I don't know, D on heroin or something. And so they looking for a singer and they got Eddie Vedder and they changed the name to Pearl Jam. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, and they did the first gig in some little club on El Cajon or whatever. And I went there and I saw him and, uh, and that when they just put out their first CD 10, I think it's called. Uh, and uh, he said, yeah, well, Larry, this is, he introduced me to the, all the, all of the guys and everything. And, uh, and uh, then they hit it big. <laughs> they were all over the place and everybody, some, my friends and musicians in the studio and then whoever comes, you know that new band, Pearl Jam? And I, and I said, yeah, yeah. But to me, it was same Eddie Vedder's voice, you know, so I kind of uh, so familiar with, so it was not like kind of a extremely new for me, but I'm really happy for him. He contacted me about like maybe a couple of years after the, uh, they've been very big and he was wondering if he can uh, uh, because I have the tapes of one of the songs that he was wanted to put on the record called Believe You Me I think or whatever the name was and he asked if I'll put out the book like and I said hey come on you know I don't do these things to my friends <laughs> so Valeri, we can go on for hours, but unfortunately, we have less than one minute before the show ends. Yeah, sure. And um, in about 30 seconds or less, what takeaways do you want to leave with the audience regarding this topic, your music? Well, music is, uh, first of all, it's such an international thing. It really doesn't matter uh, what country you're from or whatever. Uh, place you were born or where you live it's just the music it's emotion and some people love ballads some people love the <laughs> electronic music some people love rap you know or some heavy metal i don't know whatever turns you on uh, <laughs> <laughs> well we yeah but I love to, uh, that there is a history, such a wealth of history of American music, and you can go back and listen to it, all the old recordings. Oh, man, it's just endless. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And it's still evolving and having the new forms all the time, and I love it all. Well, we love having you. We want to thank our guest Joshua, our guest co-host Joshua Goldsmith on yes. the show today. But Larry, we welcome you back. Audience, you have a great weekend. Selling right. off from the James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. Thank you. Bye.